right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm your host, Chris Crenshaw, and we are live from the 336. Once again, for episode 181 of the 815 Exchange. And well, last week was a depressing, you know, it could have been a really big episode last week, but I was still fresh off of the depression that the Dallas Cowboys had gifted me, as they always do during this time. So, you know, had to drop the quality a little bit, you know, had to have a little bit of a scuffed episode because that's what, that's what this entailed. Today, back to usual quality. Actually, the production quality might be more improved. Honestly, we've got the culture ball helmet back here. We've got, I've got three different lights set up around me. We've got the mic set up. I'm trying a different audio setting. So we'll see how that goes. Should be interesting. Should be, should be very, very, very very interesting today, ladies and gentlemen. Very interesting. And of course, we got UFC 297, which we'll start off with. And, you know, thank God I'm starting off with it because it was not a very good card. Like I told you last week, it wasn't going to be. We had a bunch of upsets once again in college basketball because the, the chaos is just building. As, as Drake said, temperatures are rising and temperatures are, in fact, rising in college basketball. And of course, we got to talk about the divisional round in the NFL. So, plenty to talk about today. As always, remember to like, share, and subscribe if you guys are enjoying the content. And as always, timestamps are provided below and are embedded in the video. So feel free to skip ahead. It's long form content. I get it. You may not have all the time in the world to watch this in one go. Skip to whatever segment you want to, right? And of course, I post clips on TikTok. So my social media links provided there. You can check out there from some of my favorite highlights from each episode. And shout out to Sure, shout out to Nikon. Shout out to everybody that, you know, took part in this equipment. Um, shout out to Apple for the MacBook. I need a new one. If you guys want to, you know, send me a new MacBook, I would much appreciate it. Um, if you guys want like a, a setup video or you want to see how like I got into podcasting or anything like that, anybody watching this, feel free to comment below and I'll, I'll start doing some more like tech type videos or, you know, I've had some friends that have asked me, you know, how do you get into podcasting? How do you get into, you know, doing this like web show or doing YouTube or content creation? And if that's something you are interested in, feel free to, you know, comment that below or let me know and DMs or whatever. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, we got business to attend to in the UFC. We have business to attend to, and that business is headlined by Drake, or yeah, I want to get DDP's name right. Drake is Duplessis versus Sean Strickland. Sean going into this fight, fresh off of the big upset of Israel, the last style winner, Adi Asanya, to claim the middleweight title and I'm not gonna say I'm surprised, but it was a solid match. This was honestly the best fight probably on the main, well, maybe one of the other ones, but this was quite easily the best fight on the main card, okay? And, and that's saying something. Not that this was like a, a bad fight necessarily, but this was just, it was, it was what it was. That last like, you know, 20 seconds was very exciting and it was a nice strategic matchup, but it wasn't the highest quality middleweight fight you know we've seen of all time after you know a bunch of years of either izzy or pretty much anderson holding the title it wasn't the highest you know talent level quality of a, a title fight that we've ever seen in this division but it was still a solid one ddp does get it done by split decision i think that was the right choice i'm fine with you know split decision it could have been unanimous i think ddp won pretty handily in my opinion i had him winning two three four i saw a lot of people even give him five so hey but Strickland wasn't bad, but I feel like he, he for, for better or worse, he always sticks to the same exact Strickland. What you see with Sean, with Sean Strickland is what you're going to get. He is always consistent with the same kind of game plan, which worked against Izzy. And honestly, I am almost fully aboard the like theory that Izzy just was burnt out, like, which is kind of what he's going with. That he was just burnt out and couldn't get to that next gear for whatever reason. Because, yeah. I mean, Sean doesn't really change anything up. Fight's pretty much the same. That jab is absolutely lethal. He's very good fundamentally. He's one of the most fundamentally sound. His fundamentals are excellent. But he doesn't have anything extra. So I wasn't really surprised that DDP was able to come in and kind of take the title off of without, you know, any defense for Strickland. He was a little bit of a, a transitional champion, as we would say in the WWE or in pro wrestling. So yeah, that's what happened to Strickland. I'm gonna be honest, DDP just outstruck him. They figured him out of that first round that I think a lot of us gave to Sean. And after that, it was pretty much coasting. 
pretty much coasting for the South African. He's the first South African champion in UFC history. So yeah, shout out to DDP. Of course, he calls out Izzy after the fight. We will see what happens. But uh, yeah, DDP, Sean, solid fight. But yeah, you know, what you see with Sean is what you get. And he's not this like super duper elite tier fighter. DDP, not saying he is, but he's a little bit better. And that's what happened in this fight. And you can pretty much, even if you didn't watch it, you know, put in what you would imagine the rest happened. And that's what happened. So, oh boy, that was the highlight. You you heard how I just talked. That was the highlight of the, the card, perhaps. The co-main event in the division, which... With all due respect to Rockwell Pennington, who gets the UD here against Myra Buena Silva, why in the hell do we still have a women's bantamweight? The division is dead. No disrespect to Rockwell. Congrats, Rocky, winning the championship. But let's be honest. She's champion because there's nobody left. There's, there's nobody left in this division. Nunes cleaned this thing out twice, maybe three times over. All right. After the GOAT was gone, there's nobody left. Sure, we can do Pennington versus, you know, Pena, but it's like, this division is 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 garbage, to be completely honest with you. I don't even think we have rankings for women's bands of weight currently. It's just bad, all right? It's bad. This was a, I mean, a low level. A low, 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 low. We talked about the, mid, the, the main event not being a super high level middleweight fight. This was a low level fight regardless of MMA, okay? This was just the IQ from Pennington, even though she won, where she could have finished Brayna Silva. Brayna Silva did not have a great game plan. She didn't really have much to offer. Never really felt like Rackwell was, you know, in a threat besides her kind of self-inflicted stuff. It was just not a great fight. All right. It was a frustrating fight to watch. I think anybody watching that could have said, I'm not just saying that because it's, you know, women's MMA, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm not like that. Um, this was just a bad fight. Plain and simple. All right. It was not a good title fight. It was not high level at all. It was not like, you know, wow, this is a championship level. No, it was not in the slightest. Dana, um, respectfully, please get rid of this division and open up Adam Weight where there's a lot more competitive fights and a lot better talent. OK, and you probably can actually have rankings for this one and not have just like five fighters that were just kind of throwing darts at a wall to, you know, make matchups. This division is dead. Congrats to Raquel, though. Neil Magny, the ultimate gatekeeper of... Uh, you know, the UFC, had a chance to either let somebody into the gate of the good or, you know, keep somebody out. And that was Mike Malott on home turf, by the way. We were in the six, Drizzy, Nell Boys, everybody was in attendance, okay? And what was Mike Malott, who everybody, the, the young veteran Mike Malott, you know, the, 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 the young vet, you know, everybody thinks he's younger than he is. He's actually 31 years old, so it's kind of hard to call him a prospect. But even though he was being featured as a prospect going into this, and he was dominating this fight for nearly three rounds, nearly three. Oh, because in the third round, his tank was gone. And his hopes of winning just started falling. I mean, went into free fall. And Neil Magny beats Mike Malott by KO on strikes. Because Malott gasses himself out. Third round, his tank is empty. Magny's still good to go. He took all the punishment. He was still there, ready to go. and. He does what a gatekeeper does, and he, he gatekeeps. He gatekeeps him a lot away from, you know, the upper echelon of that division, and, which is a very deep division as is. So, yeah, Malat gets KO'd on uh, home turf. The gate is kept by Neil Magny. He will have a job in the UFC forever just simply doing that. He can almost be a Hall of Fame. If Cerrone can be a Hall of Famer off of most fights, Magny can be in the Hall of Fame off of being the best gatekeeper in history of the sport. So yeah, shout out to Neil. He gets it done. Rest of this god-awful card. Um, Evolev and Arnold Allen had fight of the night easily. I don't know if it actually got fight of the night, but it was in my opinion. He UDs Arnold Allen in a very, very good fight. Um, he could be next up at featherweight, and that is saying something because featherweight is a bloodbath. As you can see with Arnold Allen, even in a, you know, a loss taking a really good performance, it's just Evelyn. just looks like he might be one of the ones. Uh, Jillian Anderson destroys Pollyanna Viana, who will be an OnlyFans model permanently very, very soon because I do not know how much longer she can be employed as marketable as she is. Um, Joss DeVegas, I mean, beat the, I mean, she, she made uh, Cachoeira look like Ric Flair after he bladed, okay? Oh my goodness. He look, uh, he, she made Cachoeira look like, have you all seen the new uh, Mortal Kombat? You know, Omni-Man? Or really, you can watch Invincible. When uh, Omni-Man was beating the brakes off of Mark, 
and left him kind of in the, and before he said, I would have still had you, dad. Yeah, that's how she was looking after this fight. All right. A, a massacre. Okay. This fight was a massacre and I'm not going to lie. Wasn't too hurt about it because Katsuera has a history as a dirty fighter. So maybe this was just, you know, kind of opens. So, hey. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. That was one of the most entertaining things on a horrific far, a horrific, I mean, a horrific card, probably the worst main card of the year. Um, I'm so sorry, Toronto, but I have to say facts. UFC 297, not a great one. All right. Not a great one. But of course, you know, we got UFC 300, so they can't, you know, juice all the cards. But that was that. Congrats to DDP. Congrats to South Africa. You have a champion. College basketball. CBB. Let's start off with more pain. Just more, more pain for me. As some of you know, I am a Duke Blue Devil fan. I'm a Duke fan. So I was just thrilled. I was just thrilled to watch Nigel Henson go for 24 and 8. And, you know, at age 27 and, and just dominant. Now, to be fair, we were without Jeremy Roach. We were without Mark Mitchell. But still, bro, we lost to Pittsburgh at Cameron. We're losing at Cameron way too much for my liking. All right, we're losing at Cameron for way, 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 way too much. Now, I know next year's team is supposed to be the team, but still, we should still be putting up a little bit better of a performance. I'm not saying we should be, you know, number one in the country, but man, man, rough game. Jeremy Blakes did absolutely nothing. Jerry McCain absolutely did do something. He had 20 points, the freshman. He's been probably the best freshman on the team, I would say, and probably one of the best freshmen low-key um, in the country this year, which is what he was supposed to be. Um, but, you know, I wasn't sure how fast the scoring potential was going to translate, but it has translated very well. He's developing very nicely. So, uh, yeah, shout out to McCain. Blake Henson, though, I will say I got to give credit where credit's due, even though I'm a hater because I'm a Duke fan. Uh, you know, the standing up and taunting the camera crazies on the deck, that was, that was tough. All right. That was tough. I got to give credit where credit's due. I can't be a full-time hater. So, you know, credit where credit's due. If you ball out at Cameron, you are allowed to taunt the Cameron crazies. If we going to give it out, we got to take it in. So, yeah, Pittsburgh, congrats on the win. Duke, we got to get it together. But we're not the only team. Kansas, number three team in the country. We've been singing the praises. We talked about them beating Oklahoma last week. They also took an L. All right. West Virginia, Mountain Mama, take me home. Okay. 91 to 85. Very close game. Very, very close game. But Raekwon Battle had 23 and 9 and led this West Virginia team that would not be denied. All right. Would not be denied. It was one of those games once you, you know, saw it get started that you just kind of knew. All right. You knew where this was going. You knew where this was headed. You know what time it was. And it was upset time in West Virginia. They get it done. 23 and 9, like I said, for battle. Uh, Sumnick had 20. McCuller. Model consistency for that Kansas team, even in a loss. He had 24. Hunter had 19, 5, and 5, but it was not enough. Mountaineers get it done over the Jayhawks and pull off the upset women. The Caitlin Clark show continued, but it ended in a loss because Ohio State just might have a better team. Iowa has, as good as they can be, I mean, it's, it's inevitable, honestly. I'm going to say it. It's inevitable. And honestly, it's a little bit terrifying as someone that's enjoying this Caitlin Clark run. Is I'm I'm honestly terrified for them in the tournament because it it really is, and I mean no disrespect to the rest of the Iowa team, it really is a one woman show. It really there is a gulf in quality between Caitlin and her teammates. And as I've said many times, if she had better teammates, they'd be the best team in the country. Maybe unstoppable if they had another like an elite tier big. Woo. Or even like a Monica last year, you saw what they did. Made it to the national championship. But man, there's just, they lack quality on the rest of that team. And it has me very, very nervous for them uh, in the tournament. Caitlin can only do but so much. And that was evident in this game. Ohio State's got a really good team. Listen, Cody McMahon, 33 and 12. JC Shuttle, we talked about her before. She had 24 and 7 in this game, right? Ohio State's got a really, really good team, a really balanced team with two like guys. Sheldon, obviously a star. McMahon, an emerging star on this team. That's a dangerous team. And that's a dangerous team for Iowa. Of course, they got to run it back for senior night in Iowa City. But, but for now, 
I think this game is very implicative of, of the dangers that come with this Iowa team. And this is a game, honestly, they still probably should have won. They were up 12 with, you know, eight minutes to go before they kind of choked the lead a little bit. Like I said, Caitlin still balled out. She had 45. By the way, she's 0-3 when she has 45 points, which is crazy to think about. But I guess that kind of shows, you know, when she has to do more or try to do, you know, take more than she usually does, then, you know, it usually means that nobody else is showing up. So, yeah, Caitlin had 45, seven threes in this game. She was phenomenal. Um, got hit after the game, uh, ran into Ohio State fan. Glad she's okay. Nothing came of that. Hope they don't ban court stormings, but I definitely have always thought that there needs to be more security. Everybody's like, you know, trying to do like security on like, don't let them onto the court. No, there needs to be security around the opposing players and team so they don't get affected, right? I think that's the way to go about that. So yeah, glad Kaylin's okay. She balled out. Of course, it's not the end of the story for Iowa. They still could be, I mean, they still are a national championship contender. They always will be with CC, but credit where credit's due to McMahon, Sheldon, Ohio State, the Buckeyes, very, very good team. They could be dangerous down the stretch. Colorado. Once again, I'm here telling you that the Colorado Buffaloes are real. All right. They are, what a year for Colorado sports. All right. Coach Prime, even though they finished the season, not great. But it's been a very good year for Colorado sports. Very, very good year at the University of Colorado. Very good year in Boulder. This woman's basketball team is the truth. Like I said, it's, it's basically who wants to step up and be the star this week. They took on USC this week. Miller, 19 and 12. Sharad, she had what? 17, though. Wasn't the most efficient night. She went 6 and 14, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter because, like I said, that team is just – might be the most balanced team in the, in the country at this point. I'm going to be completely honest with you. Bar maybe like an LSU or a South Carolina, which makes sense because, you know, Colorado is number three in the country. But, uh, yeah, they just they're, – they're such a well-built team, and, and they play such good team basketball. And it, it's, it says something about how well the team's developed when you don't have anybody that's that headline star. You don't have a Caitlin, an Angel, a Paige, right? A Juju, a Hannah, right? You don't have that, that pure superstar, an Alyssa, right? A Cam. You don't have that pure superstar, but you're still able to have four or five different contributors that can step up and be that person, depending on the you know narrative or what's going on in the game. That's a testament to how good this Colorado team was. And it was a big reason why they won and got this close, close win versus USC, 63 to 59. Juju had 20, but she went eight for 22. So not the most efficient game for uh, the probable freshman of the year, if we're being honest. So yeah, not the end of the world though for USC, but you know, a game that you'll want to win if you want to be a championship contender. And Colorado once again proves that they are the cream of the crop right now in women's college basketball. Also, I have to give a shout out, um, more pain as a Duke fan, to Tara. All right, Coach Tara. Coach Tara Vandeveer has finally broken Coach Gay's record um, of wins. She's the winningest coach in NCAA history now with 1,203. She passed Coach K yesterday. So Congrats to Coach Tara and that Stanford program. I mean, just insane level for, you know, 30 plus years to be that good on a consistent basis and win that many games year in, year out. Always got to, you know, tip your hat to that. So, yeah, congrats to Tara. Congrats to that Stanford program for once again being amongst the elite as always. And, yeah, we'll see what they can do in the, as we get closer and closer to March. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to entertainment, which is very brief. I reach her. Nothing happened in music. Nothing happened in movies. Reacher season finale. Honestly, I like season one more. Not gonna lie. I felt like the stakes were a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, had a little bit more depth, should I say. Not that the writing was necessarily bad, but it was kind of like, you know, <clears throat> and I guess in a way, Reacher is a little bit of like a Superman-ish figure. In terms of like, but he felt very invincible in this. I mean, I get having a plan for everything, but it was just like, yeah, you know, it never, I never really felt like it was any real danger, right? I thought there was going to be a little bit deeper of stakes. Um, and there's going to be a little bit more with, you know, AM. I thought that was going to have a, a bigger payoff than him just being this like weapons dealer. Um, I thought Langstrom would have a little bit more, or excuse me, Langston would have a little bit more in tank, but he didn't. But uh, yeah, pretty much to summarize, Killed Langstrom, killed AM, saved everybody, beat the government, took the money. Everybody kind of split the money, did their own thing. Like Neagley took care of her dad or Richard took care of Neagley's dad. Uh, 
Richard bought a bus, I think. Um, O'Donnell went back to his family. Uh, Dixon and Reacher hooked up again a couple, well, more than once. All right, I mean, apparently they went like a week binge before they departed from each other. Looks like she might be back. We'll see, or the team might be back. We'll see. Um, or at least Neagley for sure will be back. Dixon might be back. O'Donnell, probably his last season. But uh, yeah, still a solid episode, a solid finale. I still enjoyed the season. But yeah, I thought it was going to have a little bit more depth. But you know what? I'm not mad at it. Um, shout out to Alan Richardson because I can't imagine anybody else, honestly, at Jack Reacher at this point. So yeah, shout out to that. And, you know, shout out to the Reacher team. But yeah, none too crazy. None too crazy. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we have reached the main event. And that, of course, is the NFL. Divisional round. It's time, to, it's time to talk about some more frauds. But the first team that lost is not a fraud, right? Because they were way ahead of schedule. But still, there are levels to this game. And there are simply levels to quarterback play. And there are levels. All right? There are levels. There are levels. There are levels. The Baltimore Ravens take care of the Houston Texans 34-10. to 10, And I got to give credit where credit's due. All right? They fought. All right? The, the Texans fought. Even though they lost by 24 in the end. They fought, okay? They fought very, very valiantly in this, okay? It was what? 10 to 10 at halftime, and then the Ravens went and scored, what, 24 unanswered points to make it 34 to 10. So, I mean, hell of a first half. Had me a little bit worried as somebody that picked the Ravens to win the Super Bowl um, on one of his sheets. So, I was a little bit worried. Thought, man, maybe CJ Stroud really is that. Maybe, maybe all the baby goat jokes, <laughs> maybe I manifested something. But it wasn't a B, because uh, simply put, I mean, it's the MVP. The mama, there goes that man. And he's a bad man. He's a bad man. Lamar Jackson, 252 yards, four touchdowns for Lamar, 152 and two touchdowns passing. 100 and two touchdowns rushing. Perfectly balanced, as Danos would say, as all things should be. And yeah, uh, Lamar was, was brilliant. All right, he was absolutely brilliant in this. Um, a dominant performance from the MVP, looking like, you know, what an uh, MVP should look like in the playoffs. He took over this game. Simply put, Lamar Jackson took over this game. Took it over. Would not be denied down the stretch, whether it was running, whether it was passing, he made every single move correctly. Everything you want your leader to do to win a game is what Lamar did in this game. And yeah, just the rest of the team kind of fed off of him. That defense locked in in that second half. And then there was just nothing the Texans could do. Just nothing they could do. Simply put, the Ravens were on a different level from the Texans at this point in time. And you know what? There's no shame in that. This Texans team was not supposed to be here. They weren't even supposed to be here in the divisional round. And you know what? They came, went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, who a lot of people think is the Super Bowl favorite. Went toe-to-toe -to -toe for a half. Eventually, you know, the talent, the levels gap showed. But in the end, valiant effort. But still, man, Ravens flock, we up. Y'all up, man. Y'all up. The 49ers are also up, but boy, it was close. <laughs> it, it, whoa. It was, <laughs> made you sweat a little bit, all right? Jordan Love, after McCaffrey. Brock Purdy, by the way, had a little bit, a little bit of a legacy drive. We'll talk about Purdy though. Uh, a little bit of a legacy drive um, before CMC did CMC stuff and puts it in the box to leave one minute and what was that? One minute and seven seconds for Jordan Love to have his own legacy drive. But unfortunately, despite Love looking like that next franchise quarterback for the Packers throughout this season, he looks more like Favre than Rodgers in this case. And complete and literally, literally, there was a, the, the video you probably see on Twitter, right? Of uh when Favre was on the Vikings versus the Saints, it was the same exact pass. The same exact across the field. Why are you throwing this pick? All right. The exact same one Jordan Love threw to end the game. So uh yeah, he went too much, too much into the Favre bag on that one and uh yeah that ends the game the 49ers survived the Packers which is all I can really say about that CMC led as always 128 and uh two touchdowns for him he had 98 yards and two touchdowns rushing he had seven receptions for 30 yards receiving so yeah CMC doing CMC stuff he's a big time player in big time games and this is one that what just just another just another in a long list on his resume 
of him showing up when it matters and just showing up in general. All right, CMC, one of the best players on God's green earth. Purdy was not great in this game. I'm not going to lie to you. He was not great. He was looking quite fraudulent, honestly, to start this game. Quite fraudulent. This was going to be a very different conversation if he kept playing the way that he started off this game. Of course, played a little bit better down the stretch, um, but still wasn't great. Did what needed to be done, however, on that last drive um, to put them in a situation where they could, you know, get the win. CMC could finish it off. So credit where credit's due, but by no means do not mention Brock Purdy in the same breath as Steve Young or definitely not Joe Montana. Let's calm down. It was not that great. Okay. He did not play a very, 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 very good game, but he did enough. In the end, he did enough. He showed up when it matters. And sometimes that's all you can ask for in the playoffs. Uh, Dre Greenlaw went off. Eight tackles, two pass deflections, one TFL, and not one but two interceptions as a linebacker is just asinine. All right. Incredible stuff from him and Fred. I feel like Fred Warner. I got tackled by Fred Warner. Okay. It says that he has seven tackles. I think that's cap because he was everywhere. Every time, if it was right, left, deep run, tackle in the backfield, Fred Warner was there looking like the best linebacker on the planet. Okay. Him and Dre Greenlaw look like the two best line, the best linebacking corpse or tandem in the league, which they very well may be. Okay. They looked the part in this game. Warner and Greenlaw dominated and were a big, big reason why the 49ers, especially down the stretch, like I said, making big plays and getting those stops on Love. Of course, like I said, Greenlaw got that pick on Jordan Love to end the game. Huge reason why they won this game. Huge. Along with CMC, definitely the two keys to why San Fran was able to pull this off. Um, like I said, Love won the end of the world, but you know, Went a little bit too much into the far bag, 195, 194, two touchdowns, two very costly picks. Um, Aaron Jones had a great game, 108. He was he was very, very good. Looked like Aaron Jones of old a little bit in this game. So, yeah, solid stuff. Packers, good team. But like I said, they didn't have enough. All right? They didn't have enough in the end. And the 49ers were, get it, were able to get it done, advance, you know, keep some people alive who have money on San Fran winning the Super Bowl. Who they would be playing? Would it be Detroit? Would it be Tampa Bay? Detroit, all right? Detroit gets it done 31-23 to in a game that looks, honestly, I do not remember it being this close. I'm not going to hold you. It did not feel this close, but it was. 31-23, to the Lions get it done. Um, people are crying. The Lions are winning playoff games. Um, it's a miracle, okay? It's a miracle, but once again, like I said last week, shout out to Dan Campbell. Created a culture, stuck with the culture. Now look at it flourish. Simply put, look at it flourish and boy is it flourishing jared goff 287 and two touchdowns in this game for him but jameer gibbs nearly stole the show 114 and a touchdown for the rookie he had nine carries 74 yards and a touchdown good lord that's over eight yards a carry four receptions of 40 yards as well for uh baby kamar but yeah jameer gibbs honestly his own he's his own man all right this was a great week for gibbs he went off in the playoff game Everybody discovered that he has a one of the finest women on the planet as his girlfriend. Just, I mean, it's a great time to be Jameer Gibbs. Um, and he was a big reason why the Lions got it done, especially offensively. ARSB continues to be ARSB. Amon Ra had eight receptions, 77 yards, and a touchdown. They put it on. Defensively, they put the pressure on Baker Mayfield. Four sacks, eight QB hits in this game. Uh, Melifonwu had nine tackles, one and a half sacks. CD. Um, CJ Garner Johnson, he had a pick. Barnes had a pick. Baker, up and down game. All right, this was very Farvish, right? You know how we just said Jordan Love had a, a very Brett Favre moment at the end of that game? This was a very Brett Favre esque game who a lot of people compared Baker to coming out of the draft. Uh, 349, three touchdowns and two picks is near exact Farvish, all right? Near exact. 300 yards, hat trick of TDs, but nearly a hat trick of picks. Sounds about right. And uh, yeah, that's what Baker had. Needed to lessen the turnovers. Like I said, they only lost by what? That's eight points. You know, some of those turnovers, and you know, Mike Evans, by the way, who had still went off, but had eight receptions, 147 and a touchdown, had a lot of drops in this game for Mike's, you know, standards. A couple of those plays get made, a couple less turnovers. This could have been a different thing. Tampa Bay could have still been Cinderella in a sense. But 
couldn't get it done ultimately, and uh, yeah, it just wasn't a B. Uh, Levante David, though, I would still want to say uh, future at least ring of honor for the Bucks. Had 13 tackles, one sack, and two TFL. So yeah, he showed out. Um, he was big time in this game for the Bucks, but it was not to be. And the Lions head to San Fran for the conference championship. Crazy. What a turnaround for Detroit. Shout out to him. Cowboys, we need it. All right? We need somebody to set the culture like Dan Campbell. But anyways, who, who's playing the Ravens, right? I, I got to take an unofficial water break. Deer Park, shout out to you. Because ladies and gentlemen, man, this was the worst, all right? The worst. And I'm not saying this is like a negative con. Like this is the, objectively, this is the worst Kansas City team of this run. Talent-wise, play-wise, record-wise. This is the worst Kansas City. If there is a time for somebody in the AFC to unseat their current Kings, it is now. And year after year after year, there's been one very, very common matchup in the AFC, and it has been the Bills and the Chiefs. It's become a little bit of a rivalry. But as, as John Jones in, in D.C., and as D.C. once said about that John Jones rivalry, is it really a rivalry if I never win? And that is what Buffalo Bills fans have to ask themselves today. After facing all the everything was set up right, worst Chiefs team in a long, long time. I've come on here asking if they're even a serious team. You've got the Bills, hottest team in the league, at home with the Bills Mafia in cold, rainy weather. This should have been the time. This should have been it. Stefan Diggs can stop staring. But no. No, 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 no. Because simply put, I don't know if it's Sean McDermott. I don't know if the Bills are just cursed like they were in the 90s against the Cowboys. But the Buffalo Bills cannot beat the Kansas City Chiefs, ladies and gentlemen. And they did not beat them yesterday. 27-24. to 24, Tyler Bass, I mean, I don't know if it was the Wind Brother. I don't know what happened. But that thing went wide right. Well, I mean, wide right. And that was all she wrote after they called a very questionable, a very Texas versus... uh. A very Texas in the, in the college football semifinal in the Sugar Bowl. A very Texas-esque three plays. Very Sark-esque from McDermott or whoever the OC is um, in Buffalo to not try to get any type of yards and make it easier for Bass. But you know what? Who knows? You know, who knows what they're thinking? But all I know is they can't beat the Chiefs. They just cannot do it. It doesn't matter that Josh Allen goes, let's see, 258 yards and three touchdowns. The man had 186 yards and one touchdown passing. He had 72 yards and two touchdowns rushing. It doesn't matter was throwing balls from God. I mean, through touch the, that throw the digs was absurd. Threw 60 yards in the air. Put it in the pocket. Diggs couldn't make a play last today. He only had three receptions, 21 yards on eight targets. Not great for your number one receiver. Allen playing out of his mind. Defense making stops early on, but not down the stretch. They cannot beat them. And they nearly drew the game earlier in the fourth quarter when McDermott, I don't know why, decided that he wanted some type of like Disney or Pixar inning and tried to run a fake punt with DeMar Hamlin. And honestly, even if it wasn't DeMar and we could make that Disney joke, why did you do it? You had, t what, 12 minutes to go? And you ran a fake punt in their end? Madness. Absolute madness. He had to be mad. But the Bills can't beat them. Can't beat them. Mm-mm. Mahomes, very efficient. 17 for 23. 215 and two touchdowns. He is Buffalo's daddy. Uh, Panchero had 97 yards and a touchdown. It was a party in the Kelsey Mahomes box um, with Cara Delevingne, who's been everywhere in New York the past couple weeks. She was in the box. Taylor, of course, was in the box. Jason Kelsey, man of the people. Shirtless was in the box. Kylie Kelsey, also in the box. Everybody was in the box. They were having a grand time. Travis Kelsey was busy having a party in the end zone. He had five receptions, 75 yards, and two touchdowns for one of the greatest tight ends to ever live. 
Bolton Reed and Connor all had over 10 tackles. They were handling business on that defense side of the ball. And that Chiefs defense locked up. All right. They locked up Diggs. They locked up Gabe Davis. Locked up anybody that needs to be locked up. Had them all in Alcatraz. And uh, yeah, they shut down the Bills down the stretch. All right. They shut them down. Josh Allen was trying. He was trying, but nothing was working. And simply put, McDermott, I think he needs to go personally. But the Bills cannot beat the Chiefs. They can't do it. They just can't. At this point... After these circumstances and you still couldn't pull it out, you can't beat them. You simply can't beat them. KC goes to their sixth straight AFC championship where they will take on Baltimore to see if they are still the Kings. All right, ladies and gentlemen, with that said, that brings us to the roundup. Australian Open going on. Coco Golf is, is, is ascending. Okay, Coco is ascending. I hope I don't jinx her by saying that, but she's ascending into the elite, okay? Last year, looked like she made that jump. This year right now in the Australian Open, looks like she's here to stay as one of the best women's tennis players on the planet. So yeah, love that for Coco. Um, She's cooking. Ego lost, so the, the, the door is open, all right? The door is open in the women's game for a new champ. Um, or for somebody to, you know, challenge for that number one spot. We'll see if it's Coco. But yeah, Ego takes the L. On the men's side, it is it is firmly shut. All right, it's locked with multiple locks. Like a padlock, a safe lock, like a phone lock, like all the locks. All right, Novak Djokovic, the GOAT, has it locked up. He's looking very goaty so far in the Australian Open. Looking like he's going to win it for the 15th billionth time, which is probably not too far off at this point. But yeah, no looks unbeatable. I don't think he's going to get beat. Um, I, I I still don't know if Carlitos has recovered from beating him at Wimbledon. Um, and that zapped all his powers from last year. I don't know if he got him back for this year. He's winning. But I still don't know if anybody's going to beat the GOAT. He just looks kind of unstoppable right now. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. But Noel looks dominant. Uh, Ohio State is signing everybody. All right, if you're watching this, Ohio State probably tried to sign you out of the transfer portal. And may have. Okay? They may have. Caleb Downs decided to transfer from Bama. He's going to Ohio State. Julian Sayan, number one quarterback, depending on how you feel about Dylan Raiola, in the country, even though they signed Aaron Nolan, another one of the top quarterbacks in the country, where is he going? Ohio State. Quishon Judkins, Ohio State. Will Howard, Ohio State. Hell, Seth McLaughlin, even though he looked like the worst center on the game, um, in the game uh, during the National Championship, or in the Rose Bowl, excuse me, Ohio State, everybody, you watching this, probably, Ryan Day's probably trying to call you right now, pick up the phone, he got some NIL money for you, all right, it's getting out of hand, Ohio State needs to be the championship favorite, especially since they returned everybody as is, and got the number one recruit in the country, all right, if they don't beat Michigan, then yeah, you know what, sure, fire day, okay, because they got a, a near super team Next year for college football, um, but yeah, Ohio State signing everybody, looking real, real, real good on paper, real good. Uh, Iowa did get um, some of the Alabama scraps, and really it's a scrap they already had before since he was committed to them before, you know, last minute. I think signing day switching to Bama, but Caden Proctor, freshman All-American, got better during the season, had a little bit of a rough start as some freshmen do. He's headed back home to Iowa where he was originally committed to, so yeah, I was happy to see Iowa get that. Both of the Arizona boys are staying in Arizona, which is huge, all right? And they actually chose uh, Arizona over Bama, which is really interesting that uh, DeBoer tried that and tried to steal from Arizona. Really, really funny. But uh, Fafita and T-Mac, they are staying in Zona. That's huge for them, and I love to see that um, for the Wildcats to keep you know the momentum going in that program. We'll help them retain and help them recruit. So, yeah, help them build something. So, yeah, shout out to Arizona for getting the boys back. And to end off... The Edmonton Oilers have won 13 straight games. McDavid might get to play meaningful hockey if they keep this up, you know? I'm I'm half, I'm a Hurricanes fan. By the way, we've been playing really, very, very, even though Kaprizov had a hat trick against us yesterday. We're almost tops back in the division. So I'm happy about that. But the Oilers, man, I really want to see Connor play like it's like baseball right now, you know? It was a lot like Shohei and Trout, like never getting to play meaningful playoff baseball because the Angels were so mid. Um, the Oilers have been very, very mid. And even though they've made a what so they even knew better than the Angels since they made a Western Conference final. Um, but still, happy to see the Oilers doing well. We want to see McDavid, we want to see the best player in the world. 
play in those big time moments. I think that's good for the sport. So yeah, Oilers, they won 13 straight. We'll see if they can keep it cooking. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you guys enjoy. Cause that is it. With finally a non-holiday episode of the A15 Exchange. I was your host, Chris Crenshaw. Ladies and gentlemen, Ocho signing off.